Hey, good morning and welcome everybody to VC209, our course on um, holiness. And we're making this journey together, uh, learning about holiness and um, how we can practically uh, live a life uh, of holiness unto God. Let's uh, please pray together and we will get started. May I request um, somebody uh, to please uh, unmute your mic and pray with us as a class and we'll start. Father, we glorify you this morning. Mm. We honor your name because you are so amazing. Mm. We revere you because you are the most high God. Mm. We thank you for another opportunity, Father, to learn about your holiness as mm. we strive to be holy because your words to be holy because I am holy. Mm. Lord, continue to pour out in us through Pastor Ashish. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts you've blessed him with so he can equip us, Father, and we can apply what we've learned to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone, once again. So uh, I'm going to just quickly review uh, what we did in our first lecture this week uh, on Monday, we, after we, you know, we we did uh, 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 the first section on um, the holiness of God and how we are called to holiness. We said, okay, now let's talk about the practical side. You know, how does it happen in our lives practically? And uh, we introduced a short, small section on repentance, recovery, and restoration. So we started talking about that on Monday. And uh, and the reason we introduced this short section uh, is because repentance is um, an important part of our lives, even as believers. Uh, it was important for us to come to Christ, to faith in Christ, but it's also important for us as we make this journey of faith. And so we're just trying to understand, you know, what is repentance? And uh, hopefully today or uh, definitely by Monday, next week, we will also look at the process of repentance. And uh, sometimes repentance is as simple as, you know, a momentary thing where uh, we realize we are out of line with God and we immediately say, Lord, I'm sorry. We change our thinking and change our acting, bring it in alignment with God, and we move on. It may be as simple as that. But sometimes it's a process. There's a lot more involved, especially if it's something uh, very serious in our lives. And, uh, and that is also important. Uh, we need to understand that. And we need to yield ourselves to the process of repentance, recovery, and restoration, because that's going to bring us back to a place where we need to be before God to continue in our journey towards uh, living holy before Him. So I'm just going to quickly review. I'm going to share my screen, and then we're going to review what we did on Monday, and then go forward, um, and let's see you know, how much we can cover today. And... Um, so uh, we started this this past Monday. We, uh, we established the fact that repent, repentance is important for us to come into a place where we can believe. So repent and believe. So in order to believe, to be in this place of faith, and that's the place that receives from God, the place of believing, the place of faith. In order to believe, I need to repent. Repent and belief. We also saw that repentance is important for us to experience, encounter and experience the kingdom of God. So God is offering, he's made the kingdom, his kingdom, all that is available in his kingdom. He's made it ac accessible for us. It's at hand. It's within our reach. It's available for us. But we need to repent in order to experience the kingdom of God. So repentance is also important in that. And we said that repentance is not just for sinners, but it's for the church as well. And we quickly mentioned 
you know, we just highlighted the fact that uh, Jesus, when he spoke to the churches, seven churches, um, five of them, two, five of them, he said, you know, they needed to repent of something that he pointed out. And we'll look into that uh, a little bit later. Then we said, okay, let's understand what is the meaning of repentance? And uh, very simply, in the New Testament, it's, it means to think differently. So it starts with that, my willingness to change my thinking, uh, to change how I see something, to change my mind about something. So change my thinking. And of course, it will lead me to act differently as well. So to change in thinking, leading me to acting differently. And essentially, what we are saying is, from based on Isaiah 55, 6 through 9, we said, we are forsaking our ways and our thoughts, and we're embracing God's ways and God's thoughts. That means we are choosing to think like his, the way he thinks. And then we're choosing to act how he would act, his thoughts and his ways. And that really is repentance. So when we make that change, uh, we have actually repented according to the Bible definition, right? So it could be as simple as in a moment I realize, hey, I've been thinking wrong and therefore acting wrong. And I realize that and I change. And based on the word of God, embrace God's thoughts and God's ways. And I have actually repented. Uh, but sometimes to make that change, uh, I may need some help. I may, you know, I may go through some struggle with my own mind and my own flesh, so on. It may not be very easy uh, because the flesh seems to have a very loud voice. But the other thing we see the New Testament emphasizing is that uh, there has to be fruits. Of repentance. So it's not just, I can't just say, well, I've, I've changed my mind about something, which is good. It's a starting point. But it has to culminate in action, changed action or a changed life. So repentance doesn't stop with change in thinking. It follows through with change in action. So that's important. That's emphasized in the Bible. And um, then um, John, John the Baptist was preaching. He said, you know, bring forth fruits that demonstrate repentance or prove your repentance by a changed life. Or when the apostles were preaching, they preached, you know, we must demonstrate it with a changed life. But that change in behavior, change in my action, sometimes requires some uh, a painful step. You know, it requires a painful step. That but I it, it may involve plucking out and cutting off something and getting rid of something, you know. And and Jesus put it like this, you know, you, you pluck out your right eye if that's what's causing you to sin, or you cut off your right hand if that's what's causing you to sin. May, may, of course, we know he's speaking figuratively, telling us that if something is so close to us, yet if it is causing sin, causing us to sin, you know, we need to deal with it, pluck it out, cast it out. And that can be painful. And sometimes we may not be able to do it on our own. And so we may need the help of, you know, a, a, a brother or sister who can, you know, somebody who can just encourage us to do it and to stay with that decision. And that's why we need each other as well. And God, of course, helps us by his grace and by his spirit. And uh, sometimes even the willingness to do it may not be there. You know, uh, we face, we are faced up with the truth. Uh, we face, okay, this is the way of, this, these are thoughts of God and these are the ways of God. And I'm here in my thoughts and my ways. Uh, but sometimes I may not even be willing to make the change. And that's where the Bible says, you know, God works in us to make us willing and able to do his good pleasure. So I just go to God and say, God, help me to become willing. You know, sometimes it starts with a prayer like that. 
God help me to become willing to do your will, to make this change in my thinking and my acting so that I can pursue holiness in my life. And then God is faithful. He will work in us as long as we are open. He will work in us to make us willing and able. And this is where we stop lust class. You know, the assurance we have throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament, that look, if we return to the Lord, there's always mercy, there's always forgiveness, there's always the goodness of God. If we return, we say, God, I'm coming to you. I'm forsaking my thoughts, my ways, and I'm returning to the Lord. He will have mercy and he will abundantly pardon. He will restore and he will bring about a recovery and a restoration in our lives. That is always assured for us. And, you know, I just uh, listed out many of these scriptures that we find. And God over and over again assures his people, look, if you return, I'm going to heal. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do a work in you. And so there's, there's really no reason why. We shouldn't return to the Lord uh, at any point when we, when we know that we are uh, out of alignment with God. So now let's go forward. I've put the rest in, uh, in, in part two uh, of, uh, of the PDF, which uh, I have shared. So, um, so we want to understand this whole connection between repentance, grace, and forgiveness. Now, we have spoken about it a little bit. Uh, while we were talking about holiness, but I'm repeating it here uh, just to kind of you know reinforce this, because uh, somehow in the contemporary teaching on grace, uh, the word repentance seems to be a bad word for for the church. You know, um, in uh, in some of the in the, the 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 modern church or the postmodern church. It's like you don't, it's almost like you never tell a believer to repent. Uh, repentance is never preached to a believer or to the church uh, because the emphasis has been so much on grace and goodness of God, which is true. We need to feed upon the grace and the goodness of God. Hey, but uh, if a believer is doing something wrong, uh, we have to address it and we have to say, look, you need to repent. You need to change your thinking and your acting and get into line with God's ways and God's thoughts. Uh, that has to happen. Uh, but sometimes, you know, we've kind of left that out. Sometimes we say, you know, the blood of Jesus automatically covers your sin, or you know, your sins are automatically forgiven because Jesus paid for it, or, uh, you know, you don't need to repent, and, and God doesn't see your sin, or God just overlooks your sin. And so all kinds of, you know, impressions we have given but we need to, you know, we need to correct that. And so this chapter is in some way, you know, highlighting certain truths in the New Testament or certain portions of the New Testament that speak towards this. Uh, speaking to us as believers, telling us that uh, this repentance is an integral part of our Christian life. It's not to be shunned. It's not something to be avoided but it's something that we just practice normally uh, uh, every day or, you know, as and when you need. So think about repentance, righteousness, and transformation. Now, the Apostle Paul is the one, you know, who, especially in the book of Romans, uh, who brings this out so, so beautifully. And, and if you just follow the train of thought in Romans chapters 5 through 12, and I'm just outlining this here, and it's it's really beautiful to study those chapters, which we will do next year. Um, in Romans 5, he brings out this beautiful truth that we are justified freely by the grace of God, and God has given to us the gift of righteousness. That means God has already made us righteous in his eyes. But right after that, in Romans 6, chapter 6, he says, we have received grace, we have received righteousness, but we cannot continue in sin. Right? And instead, he emphasizes the fact that the power of sin of our lives are broken. You don't have to live in sin. In chapter 7 of Romans, he highlights the fact that uh, an, uh, an unregenerate man cannot keep the law. Even if he wants to do what is good, there is sin that's dominating him. 
So apart from what God has done for us on the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit, we cannot live this holy life by ourselves. And then having stated that in Romans 8, he brings us to the understanding that the Holy Spirit living in us is the one who puts, helps us put an end to sin in our lives, the Holy Spirit. Christ has done the work on the cross and the Holy Spirit makes it possible for every believer to bring an end to sin. And then there are some, you know, chapters 9, 10, 11 are parenthetical. He, he kind of just deals with, uh, you know, uh, Israel, uh, Israel and the church. Then in Romans 12, he comes back to the believer and he says, look, so now you have to live a transformed life by renewing the mind. So Romans 6, the cross, Romans 8, the spirit, Romans 12, the transformed mind, the transformed mind, uh, the sorry, the renewed mind that leads, leads to a transformed life. So the renewing of our mind, I'm constantly changing my thinking, constantly changing my thinking to think in God's ways. And that's going to constantly change my, or transform my way of life. So basically Romans 12 is, you know, if you want to put it, uh, a very concise picture of repentance. I'm renewing my thinking. My way of living is being constantly transformed. Renewing your thinking. Changing your thinking. Repentance. Changing your living. Repentance. So you see that although Romans 5, I have received grace and righteousness, I still must live constantly renewing my mind, transforming my living. So that, that, that repentance is an ongoing thing in the everyday life of the believer. And eventually we are being changed more and more into Christ-likeness. So it's, it's highly, it's just, you know, it's just beautifully brought out there in Paul's epistle to Romans. Then if you journey through all his other epistles, in fact, all the other epistles, whether it's written by Paul or the other, other apostles, in all of these episodes, they do emphasize the fact that we have to live in righteousness. We have to practice right living. Uh, we are forgiven. We are redeemed. We are washed. We are sanctified. We are justified. God has done all of that, but it's not a license to live any way we want to. We have to live in righteousness. And I just highlighted one verse of script, passage of scripture there in Titus 2 where you know he says look the grace of God the grace of God the grace of God has brought us salvation but what does the grace of God call us to it teaches us so what is the grace of God teaching us it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we must live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So think about this. The grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. So if, let me put it like this, and it's it might sound rather blunt, but if any teaching of grace doesn't lead us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, then that grace that is being taught about is not the grace of God. Because the teaching of the grace of God or the grace of God that the Bible talks about teaches us or instructs us to holiness to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts so that he can, you know, we can be a people who are redeemed from every lawless deed and we are purified for himself. Uh, we are his own special people living in good works. 
So that's the the essence, if you say. The, 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 the New Testament is saying God's grace has been given, but it leads us to holiness. Another thing we see um, emphasized in the epistles is the relationship between fellowship with God, repentance, and forgiveness. And uh, the Apostle John brings this out very beautifully uh, in his first epistle. You know, uh, he says, look, we have fellowship with him. So what an honor. Uh, we are fellowshipping with God, with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We are walking in close fellowship, communion, koinonia, friendship, intimacy. We're walking in fellowship with him. But in order to walk in that place of fellowship with him, we cannot walk, we cannot walk in darkness. And if we say we are having fellowship with them and walking in darkness, then we are actually lying. But we must walk in the light as he is in the light. That's when fellowship with him is possible. And then we do have the blood of Jesus cleansing us from all sin. But how does that happen? He explains it. We shouldn't say we have no sin. If we do that, we are deceiving ourselves. But we must confess our sins. Right? We must confess our sins. We acknowledge it. Then what happens? He's always faithful. And his blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, will cleanse us from all sin. So we shouldn't say we have not sinned. If we, if we have sinned, we should acknowledge it. Right? So this place of fellowship and maintaining our place of fellowship involves an ongoing repentance and forgiveness. Repentance and forgiveness. If and when we sin. So I'm, I'm not saying we just do it, you know, as a, as a ritual. No. If we, if we have sinned, then we repent, confess, receive forgiveness, cleansing, and keep walking in fellowship with him. So that's part of our walk with God. And John brings it out, brings it out beautifully in his episode. And uh, one of the things, and I just put one verse here to highlight what John is emphasizing in his episode is that we should not commit whoever commits sin. And that word commit that he uses often in 1 John chapter 3, it's the continuation, the habit of doing sin or, you know, living in constant sin. If you are, if a believer is continuing in sin, then he is actually in a place of lawlessness, outside of that place where God wants him to be, right? So that's what John is saying. You know, we can't live that way. And in the New Testament itself, we see many examples of believers being called to repentance. And I'll we'll just quickly run through some of these. You know, Simon the sorcerer in the city of Samaria. Now he was, you know, a former sorcerer. He he uh, was practicing all kinds of dark arts, he hears Philip preach, and he uh, receives the message of Christ. He's even baptized in water. And yet, so, you know, so as far as we see that phase or that stage of his life, there seems to be genuine conversion because he has heard the gospel preached, he's seen the mighty works, and he has been baptized. So I don't think that that was a frivolous thing or a very light thing. You know, we just have to say, that, okay, there, he seems to have been genuinely converted. But even though he was genuinely converted, when he sees Peter and John praying for people and them being baptized in the Holy Spirit, he offers them money. And Peter tells him, repent. 
So he's telling a new, of course, he's maybe a new believer, but he's telling the believer, repent because of that thought of your heart, the wicked thought of your heart. Now, he may not have known better. Maybe that's all he knew. Maybe that's what he used to practice, that, you know, he would take money from people in exchange of offering, you know, his spiritual black magic. So he thought he could do the same thing when it comes to the things of God. And he had to learn. That's not the way. But he had to repent. Change your thinking. Your thoughts are wicked. Got to change. Go before God. Change. So, a repentance. You look at the Corinthian church. We know the problems in the Corinthian church. There are many. But one of the most notable ones is that um, there was a man there who was uh, living in sexual immorality. And, uh, and it seemed like initially the Corinthian church didn't address that. You know, they just tolerated it or, you know, maybe they addressed it and this man didn't do anything. So just let him be. So they were tolerating it. And so Paul had to write a very strong letter or he had to address it very, very, very strongly in First Corinthians chapter five. He says, "You know, don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And it's even if you have, if you're tolerating a little bit of sin, it's going to affect the whole body." And so he's very strong in that. And uh, and I've just put out a couple of verses here. He tells them, he says, "See, don't keep company with anyone who's a brother, but if he's sexually moral, or you know any of these other things, he, he lists." He said, look, you can't, you can't walk in fellowship with such a person. It's not that we hate them, but we understand there's a difference. That if somebody's intentionally continuing in sin, we have to draw the line somewhere and say, look, I love you as a person, but I cannot you know, condone your wrongdoing, neither can I be a participator in that wrongdoing. Right? And uh, he, uh, Paul is very strong. He says, put away from you the evil person. That means you've got to deal with that. Even the church has to deal with that. There has to be a change in the way they're thinking about this person whom they're tolerating in their fellowship. And he's correcting that. Put away from you that evil person. When it comes to church leaders, you know, and Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, you know, even concerning church leaders, he says, Timothy, you know, against an elder, how do you treat elders that are spiritual leaders? Uh, you know, if there's an accusation, make sure you have two or three witnesses. That means don't just go by one person's word, make, you know, verify the accusation. That means there's something wrong. There's a spiritual leader doing something wrong. But when the when a spiritual leader is doing something wrong, and obviously there's no repentance there, what must you do? If he has sinning, that means they're continuing in that. You have to rebuke in the presence of all. So that's pretty strong. That means when there's ongoing sin, there's no repentance, it's got to be addressed. Right? And you do this without prejudice, without partiality. You know, that means don't give any preference to anybody. When, when, it, when it's a matter of sin that's affecting the body, you've got to address it publicly. And if there's no repentance, right? So it's very clear here that, you know, uh, sin has to be addressed. There has to be a you know, correction being administered. And even uh, when a case uh, of a believer, uh, he says, look, and this is in the case of restoring a fallen believer. See, if a man that is a believer is overtaken in any trespass, that's any kind of sin, what must we do? We must restore such a person. So the goal is we've got to get them back in line. Right? There has to be this process of repentance that will lead to recovery and restoration. And we do it with humility because we know that, hey, anybody could fall into temptation. So here we're dealing with trespass and we're dealing with temptation. You know, if somebody has fallen in, what do we do? We have to restore such a person. And uh, as we do that, we are fulfilling what Christ wants us to do. And lastly, 
uh, this is something we have mentioned earlier. When you look at the Lord's message to the seven churches, it is very clear uh, to five of them, there is a call to repentance. And if you look at the details, I mean, what was he addressing? It's very interesting. Because to the church in Ephesus, they have departed from their first love. I mean, this is a very good church, the church in Ephesus. They're, they're doing a lot of work. They're very discerning, very diligent, uh, very you know passionate. But in all that they're doing, they've gone away from loving God first. And he's calling them back to repentance. And back to the place of first love, to do the first works. But in order to come back to that, to be restored, there has to be repentance. So repentance is the pathway to recovery and restoration. To the church in Perg Pergamos, they are accepting the false doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Uh, now, uh, we don't know exactly what the Nicolaitans were, but uh, there are two, you know, two major uh, understanding one is just going by the name Nicolaitans. This was a doc. This was a group that suppressed the laity. Nico, Nico is uh, mean to conquer. Laitans, Laitans, Laitans is the laity. So they were suppressing the laity. Another possibility is that they were just you know teaching uh, doctrine that led to immorality. So whatever the case was, this particular group of people were being accepted in the local church and the Lord said, no, I hate it. I hate what they're teaching. You cannot accept it and you need to repent. Same thing with the church in Tetra. They were accepting the teaching of a false prophetess, a prophetess named Jezebel. Basically, she was wrong teaching. She was teaching things, people that was, things that were leading people into immorality. And there again, he says, you got to repent. The church in Sardis, uh, they had a great reputation, but their works were not right before God. They were doing things God didn't want them to do. Um, perhaps they were doing things uh, 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 that were, what uh, what do you say, improper, because he talks to them about majority of them having their having their garments defiled, uh, meaning defiled means sin. So even though they had works. The works were not perfect because there was defilement in the church. So if you put all of that together, maybe they were doing things, but you know they were tolerating sin or doing it in sin or out of sin. So he says, your works are not right. You need to repent. And uh, the church in Laodicea, Le they were self-deceived, right? They said, hey, we've got everything good. We are rich, we are wealthy. But he says, you're actually poor, miserable, naked, and blind. So they had a wrong estimation of themselves. They were self-deceived. And he says, look, you really need gold. You really need garments. And you need anointing. So he's saying, look, I want you to come and buy from me. That means, you know, pay a price to receive what is truly of God, gold, what is truly of God, the clothing and the anointing. You know, you pay the price to receive what comes from God. Don't be in this place of self-deception and uh, get what is truly that, what comes from God. The true riches, the true garments and the true anointing, right? And, uh, but pay the price for it. Repent. Right? So he calls this church to repent. So what are we saying? When you look at all of this throughout the New Testament, it is absolutely important for believers, individuals, for the church, for the collective community, to be in this, uh, I'm just saying, in a place of repentance, meaning I must be constantly willing to correct myself. Lord, I was wrong. I put myself 
I change my thinking and my acting to align myself to your ways and your thoughts. So it's an it's it's a continual thing. I'm not saying we should live in condemnation or live in you know always a demeaning self demeaning manner. That's not the point. The point is we need to be living in a place where we are constant and willing to be to change because you see this throughout the New Testament. So let me pause here, take any questions and then move forward into the next chapter. Let me just see if there are any questions here. Um, any questions so far? Everybody's with me. Okay, Sri Kumar, please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, um, there are in case, um, in case, um, if the people, if as you said, when the Holy Spirit uh, inspires them, or like how you, how you, uh, like how how it is written in Acts chapter eight, verse twenty-two, and um, in the First Corinthians five eleven thirteen. Um, how the Paul is uh, I, you know, telling them to repent. Um, I just want to know that <clears throat> um, uh, that uh, even after receiving that instruction from the Holy Spirit, even if uh, directly the church, like as you discussed about uh, the grace uh, is to deny the godliness. Uh, it's not for you know, denying the godliness. So it's to, it's to walk in the godliness. It teaches us but uh, I saw so many, uh, you know, so many are, even though they know that they are doing, you know, these are not the right path. And, um, and, and even though they know that they have to repent, but they think that what they are doing uh, absolutely right, uh, because uh, they are, their attendance in the church, perfect. they are giving in the church, maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, is much more than any other people because of uh, their finance finances and they are strong in finances and uh, um, in such case um, how can we how can we you know tell that person that uh, how important this repentance is because their heart is so stubborn because they think that they think that they are the they are perfect people because their attendance they are coming to church regularly they are in the all the services and uh, but their life their walk with god is not right but they think that they are they are giving tight their offerings everything they are the best giver in the church so in that case how we how we can deal with such people or how can we correct them thank you pastor mm -hmm. okay yeah i understand the question uh we will be looking in, in, in an upcoming chapter, we'll be looking at what brings people to repentance. And one of the things we will see there is, you know, of course, there are different things. Sometimes it's the work of God, it's the goodness of God, etc. But sometimes we just have to pray that God will grant them repentance. Because it seems like in some situations, and especially when it comes to believers, right? It's very hard to convince somebody that, you know, the way they're thinking or way they're, what, what they're doing is wrong. It's very hard sometimes to con convince them. You know, you may talk to them and they may not see any validity and uh, they may not be willing to accept that their you know where, what they're doing or position or way thinking is actually wrong it's contrary to the word of god or something is out of line and then in such cases we just have to pray that god will grant them repentance that means god has to work inside them in some way to bring them to this place of repentance so you know it's nothing that we can do, 
uh, other than just just Lord open his open their heart open their mind to you and you work in their lives to bring them to that place of repentance that's one one of the ways that you know that 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 eventually people will come to a place of repentance and uh, sometimes that's that's the only thing we could do just pray for them and ask God to do it Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Let's cover a little bit more ground before we close. I'm going to um, share my screen again. Um, so the next point I just want to highlight, maybe we can cover this before we go for the, for the day is this you know another common mindset perhaps a misconception that that we have as believers is in our mind we think you know there are small sins and big sins and, uh, and I just want us to you know try to see things from God's perspective you know, and you look at it from the scriptures. Think about lust and adultery. Jesus put both these things on the same level. Right? That's in Matthew 5. He said, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. So there's adultery of the heart, and then there's the adultery, the physical act of adultery. Now, you know, of course, this uh, physical act, we will say, oh, that's, you know, some person did it. But then what about in the eyes of God, there's the adultery of the heart, and that's equally wrong. I think about hate and murder. This is First John 3.15, where... John says, he who hates his brother is a murderer. Now, physically, if somebody murders, it's a big thing. But in the eyes of God, if you hate your brother, it's murder. Or think about pride, sexual immorality. Think about sowing disunity and idolatry. Think about speaking lies or killing the innocent. Now, we would always, you know, we'd say, oh, killing the innocent, that's such a you know, big sin, or idolatry, or immor immorality, these are big sins. But we don't pay attention to things like pride, sowing disunity, or speaking lies. But if you look at Proverbs 6, and also you see Revelation 21, all of these lead to the same place. All of these are an abomination to God, first of all. Proverbs 6, I mean, God hates them. All of these, and all of them lead to the same place. In other words, God sees pride or sowing disunity or speaking lies as evil or as abominable as immorality, idolatry, or killing the innocent. So, but generally, you know, we tend to tolerate if if somebody speaks lies, okay, we tolerate that, and then we go after those who are killing the innocent. Well, in God's eyes, both are equally sinful, equally abom abominable. You know, we we go after people in idolatry, but we tolerate people who are actually dividing us, and so on. So, what I want us to, I mean, this very small section here, what I want us to, at least for ourselves, is all sins, great and small, this great and small is this, according to our understanding, but uh, all sins, great and small, 
we must recognize they're equally detestable in God's eyes, and so they should be equally detestable in our eyes. In as much as we do not tolerate adultery, we must not tolerate lust in our hearts. In as much as we would never commit murder, we must never tolerate hate in our hearts. In as much as we would never do commit immorality, we must not tolerate pride. In as much as we would never engage in idolatry, we must not sow disunity. In as much as we would not kill the innocent, we must not speak lies. For us, all of these, all sins, should be, you know, detest. We want to keep ourselves clean from anything that can stain our flesh or spirit, and perfect holiness in the fear of God. That means we just don't tolerate sin. Full stop. Small or big, it doesn't matter. We are perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So anything, small or big, I've got to deal with. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, we should not have the attitude where we are tolerant of small things and, you know, we make a big deal of other things. No. All sins, big or small, say, I don't want to touch me in the flesh or in the spirit. Okay. Um, our time is up, so I, I guess we will have to take one more lecture next on Monday. We will cover this. You know, what leads a person to repentance? I, I know um, uh, Sri Kumar just asked a question. So we look at, you know, what brings somebody to a place of repentance? We need to look at some other things there. Um, you know, godly sorrow and God grants repentance. And then uh, we talk about uh, when and how do we repent. And then the process of repentance, we will look at a one passage in scripture that really breaks this down for us. You know, we see what, what is involved in repentance, what is involved in recovery, and what is involved in restoration. And then uh, what would does a, you know, a restored lifestyle look like? Um, and then you know, why, why is this so important? Why is repentance so important? What if you don't repent? We will cover that and talk about, you know, collectively, what are some of the things we should be watchful for as a community of believers, right? So these are some of the things that we would um, look at next Monday. Hopefully we'll finish it. Then we will proceed into section three in this course. Okay, let's, um, we have two more minutes. Um, I, I think we will just uh, uh, pray so that uh, you can be in time for your uh, next class. Okay. Um, everyone's with me so far? Nobody's changed their mind about the course? No. Yes, Pastor. We are with you. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, pray. Somebody could pray with us and then we will take a break. Anyone can pray. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father. We thank you for the wisdom and the, the knowledge you're imparting us, Lord. And we, we thank you for your hand and your knowledge and your blessing that you've imparted in Pastor Ashish's life, Lord, so that he, through his life, Lord, you may teach and then uh, through his life, Lord, you may advance your, your gospel, Lord, through all the corners of the world. And we pray, Jesus, that you will continue to empower him, Lord. You'll continue to teach him, Lord, so that through him, Lord, he may do wonders, Lord. And you may influence Lord, all cultures and all nations and all uh, races, Jesus. We thank you, Father. Be with us and protect us, protect our mind. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy um, the rest of your day. I'll see you all next week. God bless you. See you soon. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.